sink. We are here. All right, here we go. We are currently at the location. We're just gonna go ahead and scan the package and give it to the homeowners. One more happy customer. Amazon is uitgegroeid tot het meest vertrouwde bedrijf ter wereld. All right, so this is package number two. Door ons op onze wenken te bedienen. Click the I have arrived button on my app. I'm currently here. I'm going to scan my packages. Hey, how are you guys doing? With Amazon? There you go, sir. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Amazon gebruikt duizenden laagbetaalde werknemers zoals Jamel om dit mogelijk te maken. One more happy customer. Door zijn regels voor detailhandel, logistiek en tewerkstelling op te leggen, kan Amazon de samenleving ongehinderd veranderen. Let's see house numbers. This is awesome. Amazon moet constant groeien. Er is geen tegenhouden aan. Bij Amazon is het altijd dag één. Zoals CEO Jeff Bezos zijn aandeelhouders duidelijk maakt. Day 2 is stasis, followed by irrelevance, followed by excruciating, painful decline, followed by death. And that is why it is always day one. Pakjes thuis laten bezorgen is nog nooit zo makkelijk geweest. Honderden miljoenen producten worden bezorgd vanuit honderden gebouwen overal in de wereld. Geen enkel ander bedrijf komt nog maar in de buurt. De distributiecentra van Amazon zijn vijf en een halve keer zo groot als het Central Park in New York. En ieder jaar komt er een Central Park bij. Ze hebben een soort kasteel met een slotgracht gebouwd, waar niemand bij kan komen. En ze hebben hun model opgedrongen aan de hele bevoorradingsketen. Hoe is dat kunnen gebeuren? Kort na het uiteenvallen van de Sovjet-Unie verzamelde D.E. Shaw een groep briljante jonge bankiers en wetenschappers om een toekomst te ontwikkelen waarin technologie en de financiële wereld aan elkaar gekoppeld zouden worden. Onder hen een briljante jongeman die Jeff Bezos heette, de toekomstige oprichter van Amazon.com. I think you can look back and think of DE Shaw at that time as the world's first internet incubator. He hired a lot of uh, PhDs, uh, computer science, uh, physicists. Uh, I, I was one of the, the few guys there who had a background in trading before, uh, uh, before starting there. But uh, yeah, a lot of uh, very diverse, very smart, uh, interesting people. He saw earlier than most people that this thing called the internet was moving from the world of academia into the world of business, that it was growing. And he deputized Jeff Bezos and some of his colleagues to go and look at business opportunities on this new thing called the World Wide Web. This was right around in 93, and suddenly growth of web traffic was just unbelievable. And Bezos was like quoted as saying, you know, nothing grows this fast. Jeff came up with this idea to sell books online, but a lot of other interesting ideas, like the world's first online brokerage, also came from D.E. Shaw at the time. This was a very fertile environment uh, back then for new business ideas. And I, I, I think without D.E. Shaw, you probably wouldn't have had Amazon.com. And so werd in 1993 the kiem gelegd for Amazon in Wall Street in New York. 
clearly one of the most momentous decisions and turning points in the life of Jeff Bezos was his decision to leave New York, to leave an incredibly high paying job at D.E. Shaw. I remember his mother talking to me about that decision and she was trying to convince Jeff to keep his job and just do Amazon on the side which of course, would, uh, would, things would have turned out quite differently. But he left that high paying job, he drove across the country, sort of, you know, sort of the faith, fateful internet mythology at this point, and he started over. De zaadjes die in Wall Street ontkiemd waren, nam Jeff mee naar de andere kant van de Verenigde Staten. En hij plantte die in de vruchtbare bodem van Seattle, in de staat Washington, waar ze snel wortels schoten. I visited to you know to to visit my you know to visit our friends and you know i remember we're also seeing the the garage you know early on uh, too it literally was uh, a garage that they worked out of it every time they made a sale a, a bell went off i do remember talking to jeff very early on i think you know maybe it was like right after they sort of flipped the switch to go live and, hear, and hearing some bells in the, uh, in the background. And, uh, and of course, then they, they had to shut it off, you know, fairly soon afterwards because the number of sales uh, just made it almost constant. Tegen het einde van de jaren 90 hebben investeerders die gefascineerd waren door Jeffs verhalen van Amazon een miljardenbedrijf gemaakt. Time Magazine roept Jeff Bezos uit tot man van het jaar. Hij had investeerders ervan overtuigd dat snel winst uitkeren niet het belangrijkste was. Met wat meer geduld zou Bezos hen de jackpot geven. En het was het wachten waard. Amazon.com, first of all, does not make a profit. We did for uh, back in December of 95, six months after we opened, we made a profit for a short period of time. And it was actually a bad decision because when things are growing this quickly and when there's so much innovation to be done and so much customer experience to be built, it doesn't make sense not to be investing in your business. Wall Street has given Amazon basically a free hall pass. Um, I don't think any other retailer in the markets today would be able to get away with the financial reporting that, that Amazon does every quarter. Um, it, it's, it's a bad quarter for Amazon if they actually post profits, okay? Jeff Bezos probably fires the teams that are responsible for those profits because Amazon's entire strategy is to, yes, bring in lots of revenue, but then take any profit that's from that revenue and reinvest it back into the business. And it does this to subsidize discounts on its retail platform, which then drives more consumers to come to Amazon, which drives more sales. So it's just this cycle where Amazon continues to reinvest its money back into the company. In 1997 maakte Jeff zijn intenties bekend, voor wie er oren naar had. We want to be Earth's most customer-centric company. So we're trying to build a completely new standard, raise the bar worldwide on what it means to be focused on customers and obsessed over customers. That's our mission. Vandaag krijgen zijn woorden hun volle betekenis. Amazon! 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 Amazon zou de samenleving veranderen met het nieuwe medium, het internet. Anything. Anywhere. Anytime. Amazon. I think if you look across all of the applications on the internet, all the things you see, it's about empowerment of the individual. Al die mensen met meer macht zouden Amazon gebruiken voor hun transacties. Met Jeff Bezos als ultieme tussenpersoon. In my opinion, everyone is a middleman. So, you know, even the farmer who grows the... Uh, wheat buys the seeds somewhere. Amazon beheerst nu de markt door individuele behoeften te bevredigen. Dat leidde tot de afbraak van traditionele sociale relaties. Traditionally, a marketplace 
is part of a town. You know, so the, the, the marketplace ends up circulating money through the town. I go to the shoemaker, I give him $10. He takes that $10 and goes to the butcher to get a chicken. And the chicken guy then gives money to my kid to be a math tutor for his kid. And my kid then goes to the stationery store who goes back to the shoemaker. I mean, so the money circulates in the town and everybody is a producer and a consumer. Once you put the money into Amazon, it gets sucked out of the town. He's in this thing to become, in some way, to become the only company on the planet. You know, British East India Trading Company was the original. You go to a territory, you enslave the people, you take their resources. If the people try to create value, you make whatever job those people are doing illegal and make them do it as employees of your company instead. Amazon does the same thing. It'll come in and wants to become the sole provider. That's the power of monopoly. Amazon groeit en palmt alle vervoersknooppunten ter wereld in. Ondertussen denken anderen met spijt terug aan vroeger, toen socialisme en kapitalisme elkaar in evenwicht hielden. Rond de tijd dat Jeff zijn onstuitbaar bedrijf op de wereld losliet, werden alle hinderpalen voor groei uit de weg geruimd. Dankzij de vrije handel in een wereld zonder grenzen, zou zijn techbedrijf in alle uithoeken van de aarde kunnen doordringen. We're just coming down now to, on his left, the Amazon depot that opened, I think, at the start of 2017. I'd sort of looking at my wife's emails. Uh, she was looking for a job, and um, there was a little notification, Amazon Flex, starting in Leeds and uh, looking for drivers. I basically applied and then uh, got a notification, come down and start. So once I get here, as long as I'm within quarter of an hour of the ta starting time, I can check in, and if there's any parcels ready for that particular route, they'll just give me those and off I go. The basic premise of, of Amazon is you turn up on the day and we'll give you X amount of pounds. We're not going to offer you anything else. If you don't want that, then don't take it. Simple, you know, we'll find somebody that wants to work on that uh, basis. The biggest drawback for me is having to watch for, for the blocks of work that are coming up. A block will probably be on that app 10 seconds before somebody takes it, unless it's a block that's at half past nine at night that nobody wants to do. It is what it is, where they're offering you money for that particular work and you're not committed to do any other work for them and they're not committing themselves to provide any other benefits apart from that cash at the end of that week. So they're obviously keeping a track of everything that you're doing. As far as termination goes, if they just say, we're not going to send you any more work, that's entirely up to them. You know from the start what you're getting. You're getting paid for that block of work and that's it. Bezos verdedigt zijn visie op arbeidsverhoudingen in het digitale tijdperk door terug te kijken op de toewijding die Amazon gemaakt heeft tot wat het vandaag is. When I started Amazon, it was me and a few other people. I was driving the packages myself, hoping one day to be able to afford a forklift. 
And, um, and 20 years later, we serve almost 300 million customers and have you know, 100 billion plus in sales. And we're just one company in this gigantic thing that didn't exist two decades ago. In de Verenigde Staten wordt zelfredzaamheid altijd gepropageerd. En werknemers op alle niveaus passen zich aan aan hun onzekere economische werkelijkheid. In a quarter of a mile, turn right. One of the benefits of working in the gig economy is you can, you know, ramp up or ramp down how much extra you want to work whenever you want. You know, there's no boss telling you you can't, you know, you have to come in or anything of that nature. It's very, uh, very independent. So for me, I'm weird. Like, I know I'm weird because I'm frugal and most people aren't frugal. And, you know, I've done a lot of research on money stuff. I invest. And for people like me, it's good. But if all of society was to go down this route, then, you know, we could potentially be, you know, looking at a situation similar to the Great Depression where everybody's broke and there are no safety nets to help anybody, you know? And that, that would be really bad. In half a mile, turn right onto the slip road. I like Amazon Flex, but I don't need Amazon Flex. And I think, I think that's the most important thing for the gig economy as a whole, or just work in general, you know? If you have just one source of income, you're at risk. You know, especially in the United States. While you have a job, If you can put money aside for an emergency fund, that is a very good thing. If you have an extra source of income that helps you put money aside for an emergency fund, that is an amazing thing. What happens when those two things occur is you can have money in case of an emergency, right? And then in addition to that, If you were in a position where you lose your job, you already have another source of income that you can ramp up to as a stopgap for when you find your next job. And Amazon Flex fits that role. You have to use Amazon Flex, don't let Amazon Flex use you. Find a purpose, use it for that purpose, and leave it at that. And that's pretty much it. That is the Amazon Flex warehouse from the outside. The main issue with trying to do 40 hours a week is this. You're gonna have to do this all day to get 40 hours a week. It's not fun. So I would not, I would not attempt to do 40 hours a week with the Amazon. Um, it's, it's po again, it's possible, but it, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna suck. <laughs> De zeer libertarische Bezos heeft altijd geprobeerd om regulering en belasting te vermijden. Hij wordt daarin gesteund door financiers en politici die hun ideologie willen opleggen aan de wereld. If you're arguing about whether Bezos is libertarian or not, one of the things I kind of fell back on was the way he responded to this article in the New York Times about how unhappy the kind of white collar workers were at Amazon. And he, his response fundamentally was like, it can't be true, because A, I would never have a company of people that are that miserable and I would know about it, but B, it's a competitive world. These are talented people. So if they're not happy here, they'll go somewhere else. And the fact that no one's leaving, and you know, the fact that we still have you know, a company running and running well, means that people are happy. And it's just kind of you know, discounting the idea of it's hard to switch jobs, you know, maybe you've got family reasons you can't switch jobs. It's this sort of belief that The market is this perfect uh, sorting mechanism and that like if you treat people badly, they'll leave and your company will, will fall apart, not recognizing that no, we need more to protect workers than just the market. So I think it's this kind of fiction that the market takes care of all ills and replaces government. <laughs> A 
And you may recognize Catherine Mangu Ward, editor in chief of Reason magazine. And Catherine Mangu Ward is a vaste guest op de Amerikaanse televisie. Ze is ook een moeder die dol is op Amazon. We are the magazine of free minds and free markets. Uh, we are the foremost libertarian magazine in the United States. So um, for some people, you might describe that as being fiscally conservative, socially liberal. We like sex, drugs and responsible budgeting. Libertariërs verkiezen de markt boven een logge overheid. Ze vinden dat de maatschappij beter draait met consumenten die met hun portemonnee stemmen en met concurrerende bedrijven dan met door burgers verkozen regulators. Drop off the kids, get on the 10 a.m. cella, go to New York, tape, get back on the... If, I'm, if, if she tapes a little early, I can get back on the 4 and be home by 7.30. So I can do, like, super fast. Yeah, no, I hopefully I get home after bath or before bedtime. That's what, I, that's what I'm aiming for. So I'm the editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine, and we actually named Jeff Bezos as one of our 35 heroes of freedom on our 35th anniversary. The idea was that he made it possible for people to have access to, first of all, information. I think the books element of Amazon, particularly at that time, before it was sort of a totally broad-based retail phenomenon, Um, it felt a little bit more like Wikipedia feels now. It felt a little bit more like do-gooding, information sharing, you know, getting every book in the world seems like a very laudable kind of goal, and Amazon was a part of that. I think generally the, the convenience factor is something that people like to play down. Like, oh, sure, it's more convenient, but what about how big the company is or how they're dominating the market or other players. But it's really easy to undervalue convenience. Convenience is a big deal, particularly when you have a new baby or you move to a new house or you have a stressful job or you're caring for an elderly parent, which is basically everyone. <laughs> Because you can still remember when you had to schlep out to get everything, it still feels like you've been spared when you order something on Amazon. I mean, my, my daughter wants a very specific Halloween costume. You know, I can, it's easy for me to remember the world in which getting an aerial costume but with a pink tail, not with a green tail, would be maybe impossible or maybe like a 17-day march into like mall darkness and instead you just put aerial costume except for with the pink tail and it's you got it and i think that's you know it's convenience but it's also we're used to being able to get what we want exactly what we want om iedereen op zijn wenken te kunnen bedienen is amazon de tussenpersoon geworden tussen kopers en zelfstandige kleine verkopers. En aanbieders op elk niveau worden steeds vaker in de richting van Amazon geduwd. I started out in a family of merchants. My grandfather on my mother's side, uh, he was in the linen store. My father was a children's wear manufacturer. Uh, I had cousins with electronics stores. I always loved electronics. Yeah, how you doing? It's Uncle Charlie. Hey, how are you, Tyler? Okay, yours open? I had a briefcase, I was 11, I went door to door knocking on the doors and selling mops and brooms, hairbrushes, hangers, cleaning supplies. Amazon themselves today is beyond a giant, you know? They have had an effect on everybody from Macy's to uh, Sears to, to everybody in the retail industry. Just so all those people are going to have a problem with employment. And the people that went to Amazon, there's no uh, form of protection that is uh, structured. There's no contract. There's no workman's compensation. There's no uh, retirement package. There's no benefits. I think maybe for consumers that they don't understand that there's an army of third-party sellers behind all this. 
They think, oh, I bought it on Amazon, I bought it on Amazon. It's a simple, uh, has no effect type of misconception. But I don't think they realize when they bought it on Amazon that uh, some guy sitting in his house on the ocean waiting for the computer to make a noise so I could get up and go find their item and pack it. So you just got an order? Yeah, and uh, we could go through the whole quick process if you want. I can't really show you customer names and yeah, stuff, no, of would, course, but this is called The Treasury of Comfort. It's a hardcover book, 1954, Sidney Greenberg. Now, I could see that this book is in location F9. Please excuse the mess. Ah. Start on the far end and work my way across. Here's the book. 1960, F9, and it's a paperback, $36, used like new, A Treasury of Comfort. This is a gorgeous book. Can't find a book like this too easy, by the way. And that's one of my specialties. I bring the book in here. We throw it on the scale. 11-7, U.S. Post Office and Media Mail. It's a gorgeous book. It hurts me to let it go. But I'm also in the business of selling books. And I have to accept that sometimes they have to leave the house. The idea you can get whatever you want, whenever you want it, is incredibly empowering to the individual. But if you don't, again, don't see the cost, or don't see the cost of something that we as a society uh, hold up, if you don't, um, if you kind of have such confidence in yourself that you don't want to be surprised and stumble on things or meet someone at a store, and, uh, and fundamentally it is very home housebound or phone bound or computer bound and very um, limiting you from real world experiences. Door het grootste merk ter wereld te worden, heeft Amazon de droom van iedere handelsreiziger waargemaakt bij jou thuis binnenkomen. Het is een marktplaats geworden, bewoond door geïsoleerde mensen die gebonden zijn aan één enkele leverancier, Amazon. Met het Prime lidmaatschap kun je ongelimiteerd films kijken en pakjes gratis thuis bezorgd krijgen. Zo weet Amazon zijn klanten aan zich te binden. It doesn't have to be enough money to pay for all the shipping over the course of the year, that Amazon Prime account, that's not what it's for. It just needs to be enough money so that psychologically they feel like they're invested to the point where it's wiser for them to go to Amazon at any point to get this, this item than anywhere else. Give a little bit. De verwarrende mix van liefde, gulheid en producten maakt Amazon Prime onweerstaanbaar. You should feel ashamed if you're not using Amazon the way that's best for you and your family. You know, if you are paying shipping every time you use Amazon, money that could be going into your child's mouth. God's watching. Who gives a toast at her own wedding? The marvelous Mrs. Maisel won a Golden Globe. And daardoor werd Amazon a nog prominenter lid van miljoenen huishoudens. When we win a Golden Globe, you know, it, it, it helps us sell more shoes. It's, a high, it's now become a physical digital hybrid membership program. What we do, the way we think about it internally, is we just want you to be a Prime member and then you get the best of Amazon. Is it for me? It's for everyone. It's called. Alle producten, Amazon Echo, Amazon Dot en hun films, spelen op elkaar in om de tevreden klant in het Amazon universum te houden. Dat is de strategie van Amazon. Alexa. Amazon is, I think, in the eyes of consumers, kind of this godlike business entity. Alexa, what time is it? The time is 3.27. Imagine a world where you can focus on your core strength. 
De data die je Amazon geeft, worden bij hen opgeslagen in de cloud en met kunstmatige intelligentie geanalyseerd om je zo op magische wijze tevreden te stellen en te inspireren. Amazon Web Services beheert de cloud die door de Britse overheidsdiensten gebruikt wordt. De cloud van Amazon wordt inmiddels ook gebruikt door onder andere de CIA, Netflix en een reeks vitale overheidsdiensten. En ze is nu de voornaamste bron van inkomsten voor het bedrijf. Amazon Web Services is een van de fastest growing en meest profitable pieces van Amazon. Het is really een remar remarkable creation dat een e-commerce company could have spawned a completely different business. En de insight that generated it was that Amazon. 15 years ago now was having trouble running its own servers and realized it needed this kind of modular uh, computing platform where different components are broken off as pieces uh, to be able to kind of grow with its customer base. It developed it for itself and then it started offering it to the outside world. It makes Amazon a very dangerous and a very confusing target for all of its competitors because here it has this incredibly profitable segment. And it can take those profits and funnel them into different parts of the business. And this is a maneuver that other retailers can't do. Other retailers don't have advertising businesses and cloud computing businesses. So it's really a huge advantage for Amazon. Dit voordeel levert Amazon het benodigde geld om een wereldwijd logistiek netwerk op te bouwen. Amazon is known to strong arm partners. So uh, whether that's shipping and partnering with the US Postal Service and then bypassing the US Postal Service to do its own one and two hour delivery, or whether that's in traditional department store retail. So it kind of becomes this, this monkey on these partners back because it partners with them in the short term and, and those partners might see short term gains. But over the long term, Amazon has so much momentum and so many high ambitions that it doesn't plan on partnering with these partners over the long term. Amazon maakt slim gebruik van privébedrijven, maar ook van het publieke domein. Jeff Bezos geeft toe dat zonder de bestaande infrastructuur, betaald met overheidsgeld, Amazon nooit had kunnen slagen. All of the heavy lifting infrastructure to support Amazon was already in place. If we had had to deploy last mile transportation 20 years ago, it would have cost hundreds of billions of dollars of capital. It would have been impossible for a company like Amazon to even conceive of doing that. Door consequent zo weinig mogelijk belasting te betalen, weigert Amazon bij te dragen aan de vernieuwing van de infrastructuur waar ze hun bestaan aan te danken hebben. Amazon is actually doing a disservice to a lot of American consumers because they're not paying these corporate taxes that a lot of other retailers are. This is corporate taxes that otherwise would have gone into rebuilding roads in local communities, building new schools, hiring police officers and firemen in local communities. Steden die de macht afstaan aan Amazon zullen daar een prijs voor betalen. Ze zullen misschien ook de controle over vitale overheidsdiensten moeten afstaan. Burgers worden dan contractueel gebonden klanten. Er zal veel beter voor hen gezorgd worden door de alwetende tovenaars van Amazon die over al die data beschikken. I think Jeff Bezos' end goal is to make Amazon the absolute biggest purveyor and facilitator of the sale of goods and the movement of goods. And so that's not just retail, that's everything from advertising, which markets goods and products to consumers, to retail, down to shipping and logistics. This is a huge mission. This is a huge objective. Uh, they started with retail. 
they now have advertising and top of funnel services. They now have shipping and bottom of funnel services. And now you're going to see all of these businesses converge. And you're going to see Amazon be the most important player in the supply chain around the world. In the old days, you know, British East India Trading Company, it exercised its monopoly with the law. What makes Amazon different is that it exercises its monopoly with code. So it's it's different. You program it into the platform rather than into the legal structure. Amazon heeft van Jeff Bezos de rijkste man op aarde gemaakt. Amazon controleert transacties van begin tot einde. Investeerders verwachten dan ook dat hun droom van het ultieme onzichtbare monopolie uitkomt. What I call Amazon's antitrust paradox is the fact that a company could come to monopolize markets without triggering our anti-monopoly laws. The U.S. regime is now centered around what's known as a consumer welfare framework. So what the consumer welfare framework says is that the sole goal of antitrust laws is to promote the interests of consumers. Now, in theory, that could involve a whole host of factors, but in practice, what that ends up meaning is that enforcers only look at consumer prices. Unlike traditional monopolists that charge for their products, and you can actually point to the exercise of market power, how they discriminate through price, how they essentially set price higher than it would have been otherwise, for example, a traditional textbook um, example of, of monopoly behavior, these companies don't charge. So they offer their products and services for free. In the case of Amazon, they subsidize it to some extent, uh, as they did in the case of eBooks when they first launched Kindle. And when they don't charge or they charge less than what the product costs, it's very hard to make the case within the traditional price conscious uh, contours <laughs> and uh, borders of antitrust law that there is any kind of offensive behavior happening. In some ways, it's actually very helpful to think of Amazon not primarily as a retailer, but as an infrastructure company. Um, there are stories that w that note that when Jeff Bezos was conceiving of the company, he really thought of it not as a retailer, but in fact as a utility. Um, you know, if you're an independent producer, or independent seller, you have to ride Amazon's rails to reach market. Um, in the 21st century. And so in this way, I think of Amazon as the 21st century railroad. And, you know, like the railroads of 120 years ago, it poses some problems um, when it comes to the amount of power that this one company is able to wield in a pretty unchecked way. You know, this is where the real anti-competitive implications of their power lie. They lie at the level of data, not at the level of price. Uh, because we did not have a very good theoretical model of how to think it through, and because we have spent the last few decades essentially defeating and getting rid of the old antitrust model, we ended up in a situation where they essentially are not liable to most of the antitrust provisions that have traditionally defended us against the power of big companies. I do think that antitrust will be an increasing problem for Amazon in the future. As the company gets more monolithic, as its market share in segments like books and music and groceries gets ever larger, it's going to come under some natural scrutiny. Yeah, I mean, a lot of American companies, not just Amazon, are facing a lot of uh, regulation uh, across European markets and also in Asian Pacific markets. And it, it's going to definitely stunt growth for Amazon in a lot of these markets. De constante zucht naar groei brengt Amazon de laatste jaren dieper de Europese markt in. En dat wordt kritisch gevolgd. Het door en door Amerikaanse techbedrijf neemt haar libertarische ideeën over arbeid en vrije markt mee. Het liberale Europa heeft altijd al willen voorkomen dat iemand zijn dominante positie zou misbruiken. Zal Europa stand houden of tenminste zijn soevereiniteit behouden. 
So the temptation to avoid competition is powerful. When greed and fear are linked to power, you have a dangerous mix. I'm the commissioner of competition. Uh, you know, Europe is different. Different from the US, from China, from Russia. Uh, this is a union built on the rule of law. And I think it has been reflected in the, over the decades that there is a willingness to sort of frame the market, to say, we don't want a destruction of our environment. We want reasonable working conditions. We don't want child labor. We don't want things that causes up us cancer uh, in our products. And within this framing of the market, go compete. And, and this has made Europe a very, very good place to do business. Because you have a single market where you have the same set of rules. You have a, a very prosperous region in the world. It is probably the best place to live on Earth still ever in history. Uh, so it's a very good place to do business. But the thing is that it has to be by the European rulebook. You can come from wherever, from the US, from Japan, from any country around the world. As long as you play by the European rulebook, you're more than welcome. That Amazon so under vuur ligt in Europa is volgens Jeff Bezos een logisch gevolg van de snelle groei. Het is niet meer dan normaal dat de autoriteiten een dominant bedrijf kritisch volgen, vindt hij. We have 560.000 employees all over the world and I expect us to be scrutinized. We should be scrutinized. I think all large institutions should be scrutinized and examined. It's it's reasonable. I see a backlash against technology that frightens me to death. I see that backlash starting in Europe, where I see a techno panic occurring uh, that says we should control the internet, we should control what it does. Well, a few problems with that. One is that if you believe that, it, that a mere technological tool can make us evil, then you don't have much faith in your fellow man and woman in society, and you might as well give up on the notion of an organized society, and I'm not going to. I'm far more of an optimist than that. I also think that the internet is far, far too young yet. We don't know what it is. We don't know what its potential is. We're still seeing the future and the analog of the past. We don't know what will happen in 10 years' time. And, and 10 years ago, we wouldn't have predicted that we would be here today because the technological development has been so fast and our societies have changed so fast. But this also means that we should not take for granted that we can just, you know make a prognosis that this is a straight line and it will just continue, because it may change. Sometimes business who, who have a relationship with a the platform, they say, someone locked the door to my business. I have no customers. Why did this happen? And today, it can be very, very difficult to get an answer. I think, of course, you, are, you should have the transparency so that you can get an answer and you can get things solved. Um, we're working with, uh, with data flows. And of course, I do my bit to enforce our competition laws. To say, for instance, in the Google case, you cannot promote yourself, demote others, because this is not fair competition and you're misusing a dominant position. And I think if everything comes together, competition law enforcement, regulation done by, done by my colleagues, well, then we can enable also the business community to thrive, as it has done in Europe, with all these small and medium-sized businesses uh, who has been serving European very well for decades. I was once in Berlin talking to a conference and someone challenged me with the idea of the American paradox. I said, what's that? And he said that it's that America has always had good government longer than most any nations on earth, yet Americans don't trust government. And Americans have had some pretty bad companies, yet they tend to trust companies. Uh, Europe is pretty much the opposite. Europe is more skeptical, I think, of, of corporations, uh, yet Paradoxically, one could say, more trusting of government. I, and so I think there's a different reflex that happens on each continent. In Europe, there's a regulatory reflex that says, with logic, that the representative government is best to protect our interests. In the United States, there's a 
economic reflex, a free market reflex that says, well, let's try this out and see what can happen. Um, I'm very American in that sense. And I think that the internet is built to an American worldview. De voordelen van de vrije marktideologie zijn misschien moeilijk te ontkennen. Maar hoe vrij zullen wij consumenten uiteindelijk zijn op die markt? Met zijn nieuwe serrencomplexen is Amazon erin geslaagd nu ook de natuur te ordenen. Zegt dat iets over hun plannen voor de maatschappij? Humans are a social organism and that that the object of the game is to find the others and connect and forge a solidarity with other people and instead of using digital technology to do that we're using digital technology to isolate and atomize individuals into their separate silos where they can be more effectively manipulated by algorithms to behave more consistently with their statistically determined paths. You know, so we're using technology to make human beings more machine-like and to make our machines more human. They've learned how to extract the wealth of a marketplace and then move on. Amazon doesn't create wealth, Amazon extracts it. You need to feed the marketplace that you're depending on. You can't just bankrupt everybody and expect to keep going. Maar Jeff Bezos is vast van plan om door te gaan en te blijven groeien. Hij wil zijn activiteiten zelfs uitbreiden naar de ruimte. Jeff clearly sees Blue Origin as a sort of form of philanthropy. He's cashing a billion dollars in Amazon stock every year to finance this, this organization. Blue Origin is meant to uh, basically invent the technologies that will allow the coloniz colonization of space. Jeff says he wants to see the kind of entrepreneurship in space uh, that, he, that we see on the internet, and he sees that as key to humanity's survival. So it's a public passion, it's a personal passion uh, and interest for him, but he also sees it as being a kind of public good, something that he could pass on to future generations that might one day allow for uh, humanity to leave, leave the planet. Main engine coming up. I believe, and I get increasing conviction with this with every passing year, the Blue Origin the space company is the most important work I'm doing. Jeff Bezos, wiens business model volledig gebaseerd is op constante groei, heeft een heroische visie op de toekomst van de mens. Hij is niet zozeer bezorgd om de eindige hulpbronnen van onze planeet en de overbevolking. Stilstand is voor hem onze grootste bedreiging. Met zijn Blue Origin plan voor de mensheid wil hij de ruimte koloniseren in plaats van de schaarste hier aan te pakken. I don't want my great grandchildren's great grandchildren to live in a civilization of stasis. Take the alternative scenario where you move out into the solar system. The solar system can easily support a trillion humans. Why not? That's that's the world that I want my great grandchildren's great grandchildren to live in. Amazon mikt al maar meer op terreinen die vroeger publiek waren, naarmate ze data verzamelen en analyseren over al onze transacties. Amazon is de ultieme tussenpersoon geworden. En dat bedreigt de autonomie van iedereen. Amazon is vaak even machtig als regeringen. Zijn activiteiten veranderen onze wereld. Als we onze welvaart, onze democratie en andere dingen die ons dierbaar zijn willen behouden, moeten we beseffen dat Amazon ongehinderd zijn gang laten gaan geen optie is. Ja.